Welcome to the Reclaim Your Rise podcast. My name is Lauren Bongiorno, a nationally board certified health coach and founder and CEO of Risely Health, where we help people and families impacted by type 1 diabetes take ownership over their lives so that they can transform with more freedom and confidence. Everyone has a different reason to be here. You might be seeking knowledge, support, or community, but at your core, I know that you long for something deeper. You're here for transformation. And that's what the Reclaim Your Rise podcast is all about. You know, I got to experience pregnancy different than a lot of other individuals, but I didn't want to miss out on those monumental moments of just living in the moment and not letting my diabetes or infertility Mm. get in the way of that. A quick reminder before we start the show that nothing you hear on the Reclaim Your Rise podcast should be a substitute for personalized professional medical advice. Please always consult your physician or other medical professional before making any changes to your diet, insulin dosages, or healthcare plan. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Reclaim Your Rise. I hope that you're having a wonderful week and you're looking forward to today's episode. If you saw the title, you know that we're talking about infertility, IVF, and pregnancy with type 1 diabetes today. I think this is a good episode to listen to for anyone embarking on a pregnancy journey, but especially if you are having trouble getting pregnant and want to relate to someone who has been through this process and has also given birth to a healthy baby on the other side. Uh, So today joining me is Casey Gerbez, and her background is that she is 32 years old, has lived with type 1 diabetes for 26 years, is a graduate of Risley's Decide and Conquer group coaching program back in the fall of 2020, and she recently gave birth to a beautiful baby boy named Maverick in August of 2023. So we all know that pregnancy and IVF alone without diabetes is a huge demand on your body, and then when you add T1D into the mix... It can not only be really emotionally and physically tolling, but confusing and overwhelming as well. So I hope that whatever stage of your journey you're on, Casey's story can shed some light on the questions you may have and also give you hope for what's possible. Without further ado, help me welcome my guest, Casey, to the show, and let's rise. Casey is in the house. Welcome to the show. Hi, how are you guys? (laughs) So excited that you're here with us today. I have I, I've, I've shared this with you, but like this is a topic that we've gotten requested so much and we've been putting it off until we like felt like it was like the right person, the right story that we wanted to bring on to share. And you were, I was scrolling on Instagram. I was like, oh my gosh, Casey. So we're going to get into so much today, but I want you to kick us off. And if you can share a story of a time that you reclaimed your rise with type 1 diabetes, um, a time where you felt like you did the impossible or you overcame a challenge um, or a limitation. Is there anything that you comes to mind? Absolutely. So um, I was diagnosed when I was five and a half. So that was over like 25 plus years ago. And I remember I was looking through um, Instagram and social media and I found UCB. And um, I was really concerned at the time with running and exercise with my type 1 diabetes. I was really worried and concerned about like hypoglycemic events and um, how my body would really react to running, you know, 13.1 miles. It was a huge goal of mine. So when I was interested in DCB, I went ahead and contacted you all. And I remember talking with you and saying that one of my goals was to run in a race. Um, And I specifically said 2021. I don't know why, but it like really stuck out to me as like my year to rise. And um, I went through DCD and I learned a lot about exercise and how um, to maintain my blood sugars while doing a race, but also just the training overall. And thankfully on February of 2021, right after DCD, I went ahead and I ran my first half marathon successfully. I actually was in range and target. Like I looked back at my Dexcom and I was like in range 92% with like only one like slightly hypoglycemic. I was like 71 and the highest was actually like 142. And I was so grateful. I was like, wow, I actually like kept in range. And it was actually not something I was thinking about when I was running, which I know it seems so silly, but you know, I had a fear for the longest of having hypos while running. So it was nice to just like let go and like let my mind be free and really focus on like the feelings of running your first half. And now I'm prepping for a run in Brooklyn and hopefully in the next two years uh, doing the New York Marathon. So it's definitely opened up a lot of gates for me. 
I, I feel like there have been guests on the podcast before that have given that answer around, you know, that defining moment, that like rising up moment for them was a half marathon or a marathon. And it really is incredible. Like you're, you know, people struggle and, 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 it's only like a 30 minute workout or an hour workout. And how long are you running? Like how long does a half marathon take? So a half marathon, I mean, I'm a little bit on the slower end, um, but it took me about like two hours and like 30 minutes um, for my first half and training, like, you know, when you're not as, you know, well trained in the beginning, it takes even longer. So my long runs in the beginning, I was only running a mile in like 15, 20 minutes, I was taking my sweet time. And then as I progressed and got better, um, you know, my time went down, but still you're training for a long period of time and you're putting your body through a lot. And, you know, having, you know, diabetes, it adds to it, but I was just grateful that during the run, that was something to like, let my mind be free and to have Mm. so much, you know, faith. And, um, you know, I had so much, I don't even know how to say it. Like I relied on my sensor so much, but now I just relied on myself and enjoying the run and it just, it worked out so well for me. How would you describe your personality with diabetes? Was it more growing up with type one defined by, um, you know, I, I see a challenge and I'm going to a hundred percent do it and I'm going to then tackle the next challenge and the next challenge, or was it more like there are you know, I feel like you were in the fears and you were kind of in the limitations and it like is a lot of like, I don't know if I can do that and kind of sitting in that place before getting to that conquering of a challenge in the example for you, like that that half marathon you did. So that's a really great question. So growing up um, in like the 90s, I feel like with diabetes, it was very restrictive and I'm, I'm sure it's still the same way now, but I feel like it's starting to reform a little bit. But when I was younger, my physicians were always like, you know, 15 grams of carbohydrates. Like my mom would write down in my lunchbox what each carbohydrate was. And if I were to like trade food with someone, which we all have done when we were kids, she would like have like a list of what things were. So I was more on like the restrictive pathway growing up. Like I felt like I faced a lot of obstacles with like restricting myself with food intake. um, And it led to a lot of other things, you know, a lot of you know, hyper focusing on numbers, pretty much it was a number game growing up. When I got to about like 15, I started to like really like face the challenges and overcome them. And then, you know, adding in the tools in my toolbox with like DCD really helped me with that. So I would say I was more restrictive when I was growing up. And then as I got older and felt more comfortable and, you know, there are other outlets because, you know, diabetes, it's not like a cookie cutter way. You know, there's so much that you can do um, and to control it and um, to not let it control you. And that's what I've really like overcome. Yeah. And, you know, we're here to talk a lot about your pregnancy journey. And I'm so glad that you, you know, led in with that because I think that it's probably similar and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but similar to approaching pregnancy where it's like, it's this thing that feels in a way impossible, right? With type one, it's like, okay, I know people run marathons. I know people or half marathons. I know people give birth all the time, but when you add diabetes on top of it. And also you add, you know, other roadblocks that you don't see coming. It's like, how do you adjust? How do you adapt? And everybody's experience is different. And so you have your unique experience and I'm excited to, you know, hear more about it. Um, And so let's go back to when did you and your husband, Kurt, decide that you wanted to start a family? So we decided, so we've been together for about 10 years. And so we decided after a year into marriage that I was going to go ahead and Um, speak with my healthcare team and try to go ahead and come off of contraceptives and actually start trying to conceive. Um, So I went ahead and spoke to my endo and as well as my OBGYN. I actually interviewed my team. I felt like, you know, diabetes is something that a lot of people, you know, have their own thought processes on, like a lot of restrictions. For instance, I interviewed the team about whether or not they would place me on an insulin drip if that was hospital protocol. Um, you know, those were things that were brought up because I also wanted to have control over my diabetes as I was delivering because I felt like who knows it better than myself and my partner because he, you know, is always there experiencing things through me. So um, we had a big birth plan with that in mind. So yeah, so it was about a year into marriage. We decided let's go ahead and try and conceive. And then that's when I started to face um, a couple of obstacles along the way. Yeah. And so at this point, where were you um, with your diabetes? Like where th- that like green light, right? So many people we talk about like, yes. okay, we're not ready because our diabetes isn't ready to give to get pregnant. Like where were you in your point of, of diabetes management? 
So thankfully it was, so it was in 2020, end of 2021 or maybe beginning of 2021, like right after my half is when I was like, let's go ahead and um, start trying. And um, that was actually after DCB. So my A1C went from like 6.7. I think it was, it dropped to like six and I was like, oh, we're at like a good area. So my um, endo really wanted me to go ahead and have like stable blood sugars and not have these swings. And that's what I was having um, because we always look at A1Cs and I did this for the longest where it was like a set number. But you also have to look at the variance, like the the variability, correct? Like you have mm-hmm. to, you know, maybe I had a lot of lows and that contributed to my average right. going down. So um, I really try to get rid of those higher blood sugars and to keep it more stable. And so I got down actually to an A1C of about 5.8 when I was like, okay, I feel very comfortable. I'm more consistent. Um, you know, I, I'm going to take this challenge on essentially. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and I'm curious, like, did you feel like this was more on you? I mean, obviously it is on you, but how much was Kurt involved? I think like, this is something that partners, everybody is different, but like to bring your partners in on like, Hey, like we can't just be like, let's just get pregnant and just, you know, we'll see what happens. It is more like, it needs to be a little bit more intentional with diabetes. So like, how much did you bring him into the conversations? Like, let's say with your OBGYN and that like in your endo, or was it more, he wasn't there, but you were coming back and then, you know, telling him what the conversations were. For the OBGYN, he was there once I did in fact get pregnant. But with the conversation I had with the physicians, he was more like on the outside, like he was waiting in the car kind of deal. However, with my endo, he did. Mm -hmm. He actually sat there. And while I was doing, we actually did a lot of um, the calls like on the computer and we, he would sit down with me and we'd have like, we'd set goals like, Mm -hmm. okay, so he would know by this time, I would really, really love for like my blood sugars to not exceed this. Now there's variability of course, but he was there to kind of make those goals with me. And, um, he was also there when I was stressed, like when I was like frustrated, like I would have Mm -hmm. guilt for having a higher blood sugar. Um, maybe one day I went a little overboard and, you know, or I, I had a lot on my mind and maybe I didn't give myself insulin 30 minutes before or 15 before, and maybe I gave it right when I ate the food and now I'm noticing a spike. So, you know, he was there for more of like the emotional, he was like the person that emotionally was invested with me. Maybe he didn't understand everything at the time, how much, um, you know, diabetes plays a role in, um, in, you know, pregnancy as well as fertility, you know, treatments and things like that. But he definitely was there emotionally, which in my opinion helped me tremendously Mm -hmm. because it's a lot of emotional load on an individual and it's hard to take on by yourself. Yeah. And I love what you said about the fact that you, when you had, let's say higher numbers, um, you, like you felt the guilt and you felt the pressure, but Kurt was like, Hey, like, it's okay. Like it's not, you know, it's just this one, like it's, it's all right. You can't be perfect every time because I would imagine for him, like he probably feels even like less in control being the partner to a type one and, and you're the one getting prepping for pregnancy and having pregnancy. So I would feel like that like it puts a little stress on him too. And for him to be that anchor for you probably and safe space made you feel good. Oh my God. Super beneficial. I mean, and he was my, he called himself the cheerleader, especially when we get into like labor and delivery. Uh He was like, I couldn't do anything except be your cheerleader. (laughs) I was like, I "I guess that's how it is. Like, you know, the woman has to kind of do it all, but then like, you know, he, he was there holding my hand and being my cheerleader and, you know, your partner is your, you know, they're also equally as powerful as you, right? I mean, Absolutely. they're the ones that are guiding you and encouraging you even when you're, you feel like you're at your lowest point. Absolutely. So he sounds like a great support system. You are excited. You're at the OBGYN. You're at the endo. You're doing all the things. Your A1C is at 5.8 and you guys start to try to get pregnant. So what happens from that point moving forward? So from that point, um, according to the guidelines, usually it's um, usually you can see for about a year. You try to conceive for a year before you reach out for other interventions. Um, For us, I was trying for about six months and I was like, we're not really getting anywhere. We did ovulation tests. I went ahead and spoke to my endocrinologist to ask her if she's, you know, it's common for infertility issues to arise with type 1 diabetics, which it's not a common thing. Um, it's actually what she told me, at least it was not a very common matter, but there are type one diabetics that also go through it, or if they have 
other um, other things such as PCOS or endometriosis, um, then they'll have to also mm-hmm. get assistance. So um, at that time, after six months, I went to my um, endo just to check my A1C again, and then because it adds a lot of stress to your life and, you know, stress causes you to have an you know elevated cortisol level. And the next thing you know, your blood sugars are higher because you're just overwhelmed with stress. So, um, and then it's funny because people are trying to tell you to, you know, relax, take it easy. You know, you'll get pregnant in no time. And you're like, that's a lot easier said than done. Um, so mm-hmm. I went ahead and I went to my OBGYN and she actually prescribed me Clomid you know, it's another medication that could assist with fertility and it helps you by secreting extra eggs. So I was like, great. Um, she was like, you know, you have a risk of having multiples. And I was like, well, after, you know, having issues trying, like, I guess multiples can't be bad. Um, so, so I was like, I'll like, you know, I'll, I'll take the chances. Um, so we went through Clomid twice and we were not successful with Clomid. So we were actually referred to an outside facility um, to further analyze why I couldn't get pregnant. Um, you know, if there was an issue with chromosomes or if there was just a structural issue. So prior to that, you know, you have to do a lot of tests um, like HSG testing and checking your fallopian tubes for structural defects. So it was a lot of tests, which is overwhelming because as it is with diabetes, you already are, you know, always on the clock, always, you know, making sure your blood sugars are good. And then you add on the stress of fertility and that could be a lot for a lot of people to overcome. Yeah. I, how were you doing emotionally through all this? It was very hard. I am, you know, I'll be very honest with you. It was probably some of the lowest points in my life. But it made me also the most, I felt the most powerful because although my body was not maybe doing what I wanted to do at that time, um, when I was able to hold my son, it was the most, uh, the most amazing feeling. And it almost makes you even more appreciative of what you have Mm -hmm. when it's in front of you and you worked so hard to get there. Just like with diabetes, when you're able to accomplish milestones that maybe you know, someone that may not have type one diabetes accomplishes. And you're like, wow, I did that while also maintaining my organ. Like, you know, like I, I functioned as a pancreas and I was able to give birth. And, and even though it was an obstacle, it was, you know, a beautiful thing, but definitely seeking help. I mean, I spoke to my husband a lot. He was like my person. And I also journaled a lot. So that was something that I put my thoughts into paper. And sometimes when I was very frustrated, I would just say, okay, like, let's take everything, you know, one week at a time. And that actually applied to fertility too. Just like diabetes, when you're stressed and you're like, let's take things, maybe let's divide it up and take it like one step at a time. Um, Same thing with my fertility treatments. It was, you know, if if this doesn't work, let's try this. And if this doesn't work, let's try that. So it kind of helped prepare me for that, which is crazy to think, but it definitely helped. Hmm. No, I, I could I could see that, it, and it's too like kind of what I said earlier, where it was it's not expected, right? Like you don't go into trying to get pregnant, being like, oh, I'm gonna be in that percentage of people that has fertility issues. Do you? I don't. I'm. I, I can look it up after, but do you know the percentage of people that do have um, like go through I, IVF with diabetes? Yeah, or I mean, just in general, like end up. I actually don't know the exact percentages, but like the success is usually around sixty percent. But that's okay. advertised that way. However, like multiple people go through multiple rounds of IVF. So for us, mm. it was not just a one round fix all. And it's also not a cookie cutter fashion. So for us, we had undiagnosed infertility, which is also frustrating because it's like, you know, you have an autoimmune disorder. You don't know how you triggered your body to do this, right? Or maybe, you know, your beta cells weren't working. And so that's one like question mark in your life. And then this was another question mark. You know, we checked all the boxes for everything, everything green light looked great on paper. And unfortunately it just was not for us naturally. Um, but fertility mm-hmm. treatments usually should work at that rate for IVF. It's a 60%. But um, like I said, for us, it didn't work in that fashion. We ended up not even having viable embryos um, through our first round of IVF. Wow. And so we had to do a second round, which um, in like a six month window. So it's, and it's a long process. I don't know if anyone's like told you about IVF, but the process mm-hmm. of IVF is very, it's not as, I thought it was fast. Like, okay, we take these shots, you know, um, but it, it's a lot, it's a mental load. Um, it's, it's a lot. And I honestly wish that IVF came with like some type of mental health counselor because to walk mm-hmm. you through the process, because it's overwhelming to say the least, it's worth it. 
I would do it. I would do it again and again, but it, it's overwhelming. I mean, from, you know, you, you have three months of stimulating, you know, going on birth control, which is ironic to get your body back to, you know, homeostasis to then come off birth control, prime your body to make an abnormal amount of eggs. And it makes your ovaries grow four to five times their size. So by the end of these two-week window, you almost look like you're three months pregnant because your ovaries are that large and engorged. And then you have to go under anesthesia, um, under like twilight, and they actually remove your um, your eggs. And then that's when they combine it with sperm and create an embryo. But sometimes, you know, they don't like to meet. And sometimes um, they don't become what we call blastocysts. So you know, sometimes the cells don't form and you're left with no viable embryos. And that's what happened with us, which the likelihood of that was super low, like in the percentage, like less than 10%. Mm -hmm. So we were bummed about that. So, and then it's, you know, after that, it's once you do have a viable embryo, which we only had one actually, um, out of like 40 something eggs, I ended up with one, one embryo that actually worked. And we're so grateful for that. But for the transfer process, that also includes a lot of medications. I mean, you're on shots three times a day, intramuscular and sub Q. Mm. And it's so different because with diabetes, it's like my life, right? So I, I'm used to it. I'm used to giving myself, you know, I having sites um, because I'm a, you know, I'm a pump user. So I haven't actually given myself an injection, mm -hmm. honestly, you know, unless I'm having a pump malfunction, like consistently since back in 2001. So it was a mental mind game to have to give myself shots again. I was like, this is crazy. And, and a lot of people were like, oh, well, you're a diabetic. So, you know, IVF, it's going to be easy for you because you give yourself shots every day. So that's just another shot to add to your regimen. But what people don't understand is, you know, we deal with so much already and then just add that to your workload. And then go in and see how you're doing every other day for ultrasounds and blood work. Next thing you know, you're like, hi, it's overwhelming. Um, you can tell. <laughs> yeah. I think to be honest, that's one of the hardest things for me personally with type one diabetes is, and I don't, and it sounds like you feel this way as well, where it's like, you know that this is, and you relate to this as your challenge in life, right? This is your one, this is like your one thing. And then when you get to a place where you quote unquote conquer it, or you, you know, really reclaim your rise, you feel like, you know, you're in a good place with it. It's kind of like, almost like you want to check the box of challenge in your life. And then when you get another challenge, you're like, wait a second, like, that's not my card. That should be somebody Correct. else's. Like, why, why am I also having to go through it? So was there how was that that part of it as well for oh, you? Yeah, I mean, for me, it was like I I think about when I go through challenges in life. I look at I look at it kind of like in a comical standpoint. Like a, a, I'm a comedian. What can I say? Like I'm like, oh great, so mm -hmm. like you know, I can't win the lotto. But then you put my name in the bucket for like infertility, type one diabetes, add on anxiety with all that, and next thing you know, you're like <laughs> wonderful. How did I not win the lotto and like cash in my grand prize? Like. You know, so it's hey. like the irony of that is that, you know, you go through a lot already and you think, well, I'm done. And then unfortunately mm. you get handed another, another challenge to add to your list, which, you know, it, no one wants to go through that. And, you know, you, we plan out our lives, I think. And, and also with social media, like, you know, you see, you know, everyone else moving on and their life is, you know, they're moving on, you know, they're having families and, you know, you, it's, it's a blessing and a curse, right? Social media is great because it helps with, you know, um, spreading awareness, but then you're like, wow, everyone's life is, everyone's keeps moving forward and I'm stuck. Like I'm stuck right here. I'm waiting for my moment to rise, right? I'm waiting for my, you know, me to hold my baby, um, and to get pregnant and to, you know, not have to worry about my diabetes in conjunction with taking fertility, you know, treatments and, and it's, it, you know, it also will affect you later because then, you know, throughout your pregnancy, you're really worried about, you know, what if something bad happens too? So it's like almost like a mindset like where you have to change it. Like, I can't be this negative. It's not good for me. And you kind of have to tell yourself, like, take it one day at a time. And, and that's essentially what, like, I would recommend to anyone going through fertility issues with, in conjunction with diabetes is take it like one day at a time, because sometimes if you take on, or if you look at the whole picture, it's just so overwhelming. And then, you know, if you go on every day, you can kind of cross, I'm, I'm like a list girl. I check things off my list. So, you know, I'm like, okay, I gave myself my morning shots, gave myself my, you know, evening shots. 
I put on, you know, alarm clocks to change my sensors and my, you know, my insulin shots and things like that. So it's almost like you have to remind yourself to also don't forget about your diabetes as you're going through a big milestone in your life too. So what was that like support like while you were going through IVF treatment? Like, and also what were your blood sugars like? Like how often were you talking directly to your endocrinologist versus how often were you kind of like making changes on your own? And then what patterns and things were you noticing with your blood sugars? So my endo, she was, she knows I'm the type of person, I'm a very type A person. So um, I feel very comfortable, especially after DCB, making those like little minuscule changes on my pump. I'll be like, oh, like, let me do a basal check. And that's when I would notice um, in the mornings after doing all my injections, um, especially I'd have the most, um, I guess, the most grams, like milligrams of my medications in the morning for my IVF drugs. So I would notice a really big rise because I, especially when I would go to work and I'd wake up super early, you know, around like five in the morning and I would always have a rise in my blood sugar then right when I get out of bed. And then immediately after that, following that, I would give myself like a surge of hormones, right? I would give myself, um, it's gonalef and menopure. Those are both hormones to help facilitate, you know, follicle stimulating hormones. So that's going to help you grow those nice, amazing eggs to one day, you know, become embryos. So with that, my blood sugars would spike really high. I actually talked to not only my endo, but my IVF doctor. And this is one thing I will urge you to do and anyone to do that's going through this is really, really look at your physicians because, you know, some physicians have more experience with type one diabetics than others. And um, my physician at the time didn't know anything about mm-hmm. insulin and type 1 diabetes uh, in conjunction with IVF drugs, but my endocrinologist did. She was actually well-versed, so I was very lucky that she was able to say, hey, every week I'm going to have you download twice a week. We're going to make changes to your blood sugars as they go, because if you look at it, just like when we talked in TCB about um, hormones and how leading up to your menstrual cycle, um, you have fluctuations. Same thing happens when you're stimulating your body in preparation for IVF and for transfer. Same thing. So you're, um, I always noticed a rise in like day 10 of um, all these hormones, and that was because they were at their peak. So um, that's when I would have higher, more resistant blood sugars. But my, I would follow up with my endo, like I said, twice a week minimum. And if I had any issues, um, I would make my little changes and then just reach out to her and say, hey, can you just go through and look at you know, my, um, my blood sugars, my trends in the past 72 hours and see how that is. And if you have any other you know, recommendations, let me know. But when I had insulin resistance a lot, I would really focus on walking um, and trying to bring those blood sugars down because once you get past a certain point of your um, – IVF journey, um, you actually cannot work out anymore, which really, really bothered me because I was like, what? It can cause ovarian um, like twisting of your ovaries once they get to a certain size. And that was my outlet, my mental outlet going through IVF. Wow. But it was also an outlet for me when I would have really, you know, higher blood sugars, I would exercise, like, you know, do what some type of hit workout would usually drop personally drop my blood sugars. And so, you know, taking that off the table for me was really hard, but then I was like, you know what, I can do my, um, my, I forgot what they're called, but we used to do like the, um, the squats, the diabetes squats, the sugar it, squats, yes, yes, sugar squats. Um, so I would do that in conjunction with walking. I would just walk outside after eating because I would notice a huge, like spike in my blood sugars. Also, I, I noticed lows too. Um, leading up to my retrieval, I had lower blood sugars. Um, so I was really cautious with that. So, and it almost resembled pregnancy for me too. So, you know, it was a kind mm-hmm. of a, a, a good look at maybe how pregnancy would be, um, but just on steroids in my opinion. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. You know, you were dealing with, you were dealing with a lot and, and that's, I think you were fortunate that your doctor, you know, had experience with that. And that was probably just like comforting for you to, to know and to kind of bounce off of, even though you're very like, you're, you're taking ownership and you're making those changes or whatnot. So when you went through your second round of IVF, at what point do you, and I, and I really, I apologize. I'm so naive to this topic and like, I'm learning so much from no, this, but like, at what point do you know, like, and how many months in like that it was successful? Successful. So um, usually with IVF, um, you'll do your transfer. Your transfer, um, it's called the two-week wait. You'll probably see that all over social media. It's a two-week wait window. Um, That's when you transfer your embryo and you wait two weeks. And then usually it's confirmed by a blood test. 
So um, at that two week window, I went ahead and did blood work um, that confirmed my pregnancy. However, they aired me on the side of caution. They were like, you know, it could be ectopic. It could be a pseudo pregnancy, which I didn't even know was a thing until going through IVF, which is when your body thinks it's pregnant, but it's really not, but it simulates like the the actual, you know, um, hormones that signify that you're Mm -hmm. pregnant. So I was like, Oh, wow, this is a lot. Um, So I went ahead and found out at two weeks, but we waited until seven weeks to so that we can actually see the yolk sac and see, you know, the baby on a monitor um, through like a transvaginal ultrasound. It took two weeks to finally like see it, but the whole process itself, one round three months minimum. So it's, you know, a lot in every other day doing ultrasounds and blood work. So it's, definitely something that once you're invested, you're really invested in until, you know, you can get through the other side, which we are the lucky few, because I know there's still some people out there that they go through treatment and, you know, they're not successful and, you know, they're Mm -hmm. very resilient. Um, And it made me have like so much more respect for my body because, Mm -hmm. you know, I, you know, usually at this point in your life, you would say, Hey, you know, I'm angry with my body. I, I, can't make insulin. I can't have a baby naturally. Like, what can I do? Um, and that, those are things that go through your mind as you're going through this. But um, once I got through that, I'm like, wow, like my body is capable. Like I'm capable of giving myself I'm my own organs outside my body, my pancreas and my ovaries at this point. <laughs> so, you know, it, it gave me a whole new mindset and appreciation. Absolutely. So, you know, when you're going, when, when you got pregnant, right in that whole nine month journey, what, what things grounded you in your ability to, you know, prioritize your blood sugars and the health of the baby and the health of you? What were things that you, habits or tools, strategies that you feel like were like consistently showing up for you? So um, a couple of things. So before I I got pregnant, I did a lot of research, you know, on the book. There's two books. I honestly, I'm so sorry. I forgot the name on one of them. But um, anyways, it was actually um, type 1 diabetes and, um, you know, conceiving, getting pregnant and postpartum. And um, that book was really beneficial because it kind of gave me a week to, it actually showed me a week to week of like, At this week, normally, you know, it's not like a cookie cutter fashion, of course, but in this book, it kind of teaches you like, okay, you start to experience this at this trimester. And for me, pregnancy and type one, what grounded me was really just um, having good support and my resources, like researching everything beforehand. So your first trimester, you're going to have a lot of lows. Um, It's very common to be hypoglycemic. Um, That's usually one of the first signs you're pregnant is having lower blood sugars. Um, to the point where I remember I was like, am I a diabetic? Like, is this a cure? <laughs> like, I was like, I, I ate like a hundred grams of carbohydrates and I'm like not giving myself that much insulin. Um, so it's like in the beginning, you're like, wow, like this is crazy. I mean, yeah, people have morning sickness, this and that, but I was like, this is fabulous. Like, you know, I'm not giving myself all this insulin. And then, right. you know, then, um, your placenta starts to kick in and that causes you to have elevated blood sugars. So now your placenta kicks in after, you know, Mm -hmm. week 13, you're like, oh my, what what just happened? Like that, like insulin resistance went like through the roof and you're like, oh my goodness. Um, And then, you know, your third trimester is when your placenta is like, hey, Chica, I'm in overdrive right now. Like, you know, we got to get this baby um, fat and chunky before delivery. So let's just add more hormones. And um, by then your insulin resistance is to the roof. Mm -hmm. So um, and that's when you're like, no, I need it to be the tightest because yeah. now I'm going to deliver. And so the whole pregnancy, it was communication with your endo. I mean, I will say, you know, the DCB group um, and the tools that were provided with that really, truly helped me because I actually went and I journaled food. So for my um, second trimester, when I started to notice a peak of mm. like insulin resistance and elevated blood sugars, I was like, let me like dust it off, go back to like the basics. And so I wrote down what foods maybe were causing me insulin resistance. Okay, this time I pre bolus 15 minutes before, but now I'm noticing it's not really sufficient. Let me pre bolus. 30 minutes before to try and catch that peak. And that truly helped me because it kind of gave me, 
you know, it, it wasn't as frustrating because I know for some diabetics, pregnancy is frustrating for me. It was too, trust me, it was no walk in the park, but with tools like that and Mm -hmm. more knowledge, you're able to overcome so much without getting so frustrated and you're able to enjoy being in the moment of pregnancy. And I think that for me Mm -hmm. was my favorite part. It was not, what's my blood sugar every five seconds. It was I get to rub my belly and there's something, you know, there's someone inside of me and I'm so excited to like, you know, I talk to him every day. And so it was, you know, I got to experience pregnancy different than a lot of other individuals, but I didn't want to miss out on those monumental moments of just living in the moment and not letting my diabetes or infertility Mm. get in the way of that. And so that was something that it took a while. My husband actually was like, Casey, you got to let go. Like you have to sit and just stop thinking for one second. You're on this constant, you know, wheel. He's like, jump off. He's like, breathe. Were you ever though? Like, you don't get it. Yes. You don't have oh diabetes. My God. I was like, I was like, <laughs> That's what I was I was like you, okay, first of all, you're a guy. So like you're a dude. So you don't have to care. You don't have to have like go through labor. Yeah. You don't have to like do delivery. I mean, there are so many things I was like, I- Oh, easier said than done, sir. But it, it is true. Like mm-hmm. he was like, you know, you have to really enjoy the moment because it, it's, you know, time's a thief, right? Like, you know, we only live certain opportunities and moments in that fraction of, you know, a second and or in that time span. So, you know, I had to, he was like the person that was like type B personality, by the way, total type B, totally opposite of me was like, take it easy. And so then for those like 10 minutes, I'd be like, oh, this is exciting. And then I would hear an alarm and it'd be like 131. And I'm like, and back to reality. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. It's just, it's crazy. Like how tight the control needs to be. But I think that to your point, you in coaching, we had built, you, you had a foundation, you had a solid foundation. And I think what a lot of people, you know, ask is like, is coaching better during pregnancy? Because we've coached a ton of people during their pregnancy, but also they'll say like, or is it, you know, better before. And I think it's really, you know, it's up to the person, but I think the before and the prepping for pregnancy, if you can, and you, you know, have that opportunity to do coaching then, like, I think that's a really special time because you have this opportunity to understand your patterns and learn and see where your education gaps are and strengthen your intuition, I think, with yourself and your confidence. And just because you're not pregnant throughout that time, like those skills transfer to when you are pregnant. And even though there are new patterns, it's just the same way that you would find your patterns before pregnancy. Like you're just applying them, applying that to you know, what's happening throughout the three different trimesters. And it seems like for you, like that was how you approached it of like, let me just take this toolbox and apply it here. And, and of course you're going to be, there's no like sitting back, relaxing for anybody that has type one and being like, Oh, I'm craving a bag of Cheetos. Let me just eat the whole thing. Right. Like we have to like be real about like obvious, some limitations that aren't going to serve us, but I don't know. Like, it seems like it was the nine months were, I mean, you deserve it after the IVF treatment. Like it was a little bit, it wasn't like crazy horrible. No, I mean, definitely it was, and also with community too, that's another thing. Um, I had a lot of women from DCB that went through pregnancy maybe before DCB Mm -hmm. uh, and they were like, oh, by the way, like I noticed, you know, higher blood sugar starting at this week. So they'd kind of like give me like, hey, by the way, like this might start happening, like be on the lookout. And so it was so funny because I had like a couple of girls from the DCB group from like our cohort reach out to me and say like, hey, this is what's going to, this happened to me. It may not happen to you, but just be on the lookout. And this is what I did. And looking back at it, I wish I would have seen it differently, right? Like, so they kind of used what DCV taught them, applying it to their past, maybe before they went through DCV. And now they're like, hey, this is what's happening. So, you know, that community really helped me because then I was able to kind of anticipate as I went through, along with like reading and those resources, applying it to like people in real life Mm -hmm. um, helped me out tremendously. But definitely the nine months, definitely hard. Um, And of course, with IVF comes preeclampsia because like, I believe it's one out of every three has preeclampsia with IVF. And um, also with type 1 diabetes, it increases that risk. So I was actually undiagnosed uh, with preeclampsia when Mm -hmm. I was 37 weeks. I was actually induced at 37 and four. 
um, because I was like super fluid overloaded. I gained like 15 pounds in a span of a week. Mm. Um, you know, and those were red flags that I spoke to my healthcare providers about that I was concerned with. I was like, this is not good. You know, I am having these issues. I really need to be seen. And, and then that's how I like kind of progressed and went through and actually had to be induced like slightly earlier, um, just for the safety of myself and my baby. Yeah. Well, no, thank you for, for sharing that. You're so well-versed on all of this. I know it was your life for, you know, so many months, yes. but I think it's going to be <laughs> helpful for somebody to listen who's either, you know, going into pregnancy just to know like they're, you know, if it, if I'm not you know, successful on the first try or whatnot, like there are successful stories like yourself, like from IVF, but what is it like now having Maverick? Like what has postpartum looked like for you? And just give us like a little bit of a, an inside look. So postpartum, I mean, no one can prepare you for postpartum until you experience it. But, um, you know, I am lucky. I'm like one of the lucky few, in my opinion. I felt like I did a lot of preparation on my like mindset while going through IVF, which yes, it was difficult, but it prepared my mind a lot. So when I had him, I know a lot of people are concerned about baby blues and postpartum depression. Mm -hmm. And thankfully, you know, I have like a really good framework and support system. So, you know, I was able to have a lot of support after postpartum. So I did not, um, you know, go through that, which I'm grateful for. However, postpartum, you know, I did have, um, blood loss. I did require transfusions. That's the scary part of postpartum, but it's not anything too scary because it it could happen to anyone, right? It's not because you're diabetic, but looking at Maverick and all that. So um, it's wonderful. I mean, downfall, one only one downfall is, you know, I look back and I'm very tight on my blood sugars and, um, you know, a new baby changes your whole life, right? I mean, it's such a blessing. He is everything we hope for more. I mean, I look at him every day and I'm like, I don't know. I made the cutest baby. Like, I'm sorry. I'm very <laughs> like, I'm sure everyone says that. I'm like, oh my God, he's perfect. Like, I'm like, he's, he's fabulous. Like, I couldn't think of a more beautiful baby in my life, but like, you know, everyone says that. But I mean, it truly like holding him oh. and going through all this, it makes it worth it. And, and it, I'm giving my body grace, right? Every day I give my body grace. Um, you know, my blood sugars may not be in, you know, I used to be in like, you know, keeping my blood sugars in range for at least, you know, my goal was like DCB. We always said, right, 80%, I believe was like what we were we were really trying to get towards. But like, you know, for after having a baby, um, I would say my time in range is like, you know, I went from 90%, 95% when I was pregnant down to like maybe 80 to 84%. Um, And that's just a lot of trying to deal with manage my diabetes with a newborn and then working. So, you know, I have to give my body grace. Um, You know, it's something that um, alarms. Now I put my sensor to remind me to change my um, infusion set alarm. I never put that on before, but having a baby, you kind of like, you know, you're so busy doing everything else. Like you're breastfeeding, you're, um, you know, you're pumping, you're worrying about work, you're um, dealing with like, you know, his milestones, making sure he does tummy time. So um, I had to put those alarms on my pump so I can like remind myself like, hey, don't forget, like you need to change your site. It's day three. So like, that's something that has been beneficial for me, but postpartum has been a beautiful journey. It was, you know, it was long worth it. It was, it was a long process, but you know, every step led me to him and, you know, um, that's what I'm grateful for. And, you know, it's something that I think when you go through infertility treatments and you have diabetes and, you know, you may not have the easiest route, but look how far you've overcome everything like you've overcome so much and it's a blessing it really is and to hold him ah. <laughs> no I, I and i'm so i'm just so 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 happy for you he is adorable you. <laughs> and you're like i mean you and Kurt seem like you're gonna i mean you already are incredible parents and he's so lucky to um have been that like chosen baby to come into your life um my last question for you is if you had to give one piece of encouragement or advice to someone who has type 1 diabetes and is embarking on an IVF journey, something maybe you wish someone told you, what would that be? So I would say uh, take life one step at a time. If you take on the whole picture of IVF or diabetes in general, you get overwhelmed. So I would say take every step, you know, with give yourself grace and 
you know, take every day one step at a time. Um, you can't accomplish, you know, Rome wasn't made in one day. You can't expect to, you know, go through this journey and, you know, oh, how do I say this? this is gonna, it gets emotional to me for me because, you know, you go through a lot and, you know, I have a lot of empathy for people that are going through IVF and just know you're not alone. Um, I felt very lonely and isolated during IVF because there weren't a lot of people with diabetes. Um, I actually spoke to one girl and that um, she was in another state with type 1 diabetes going through IVF. And we both said it. We said we felt very isolated and we felt very alone. Um, but just know you're not alone and that you have a good, you know, hope I'm here, you know, our community's here um, and you're not alone. It's overwhelming, but this is just one season of your life. And hopefully the next season will be filled with a baby. And so that's something to look forward to. Oh, Casey, thank you so much. Thank you of for, course. I wish I'd give you a hug right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it makes it all worth it. It really does. Oh. Like I, I look back at it and I'm like, what a blessing this has been. I mean, you know, obviously do not want to go through IVF again, but you know, what a blessing it is that I have my son here on earth side with me. Absolutely. Well, we so appreciate you coming on and sharing your story and your experience. You are absolutely glowing. And I know have being a mother and a parent, yeah, go, you want to go get him? Yeah. I want to, I want to see him. But you, you know, it's, it's, it changes a lot, but, um, you're handling that change with just, you know, I, you're inspiring. You're inspiring. Oh, thank you. We appreciate like, it. Oh my gosh. He was right there the whole time. <gasps> yes. <laughs> oh my goodness. Who my is little he? chunkaroo. <laughs> Even he looks like more like you or Kurt. Like what's the verdict? I think, well, he has Kurt's brows. He has strong brows. Uh-huh. Um, so I would say he's Kurt um, in that aspect. Oh. But I feel like his eyes look like me. So I'm like, <laughs> and he's my little boogaloo. Six months now? No. No, he looks like he's a six monther. Let me tell you, he's like 99% for like weight and height. I'm like, oh, he's a chunkaroo. Like, look at this bad boy. Wait, <laughs> August, right? Was August. So August, August September, October, November. Right oh my God. Four, December, four months old. Yes. And, and he's so chunky. <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, yes. he's adorable. Yeah. Thank you so much. Like, see, this is my everything. I hope that like other people can enjoy this. Like this is possible. Yeah. It is yeah. possible. <laughs> Everybody who's listening in, go watch the video on YouTube so you can see how special <laughs> Baby Maverick is. <laughs> Sending you both so much love. Say hi to Kurt for me. Thank and um, thanks for coming on, Casey. Thank you so much, Lauren. I hope you guys have a wonderful day. Thank you so much for being here with me today and listening to this episode of Reclaim Your Rise. To let us know that the episodes we're putting out are impactful and to help us get our street cred up and let everyone else know that this is something worthy of their time to listen to, please leave a rating and review on our Apple podcast, send the show to other people impacted by T1D or maybe even your doctor, and share it on social media tagging at Risely Health and at Lauren underscore Bongiorno. New episodes of Reclaim Your Rise come out every single Tuesday, so make sure you are subscribed to the podcast so that you never miss a beat. Thanks again for listening, and as always, remember, diabetes is a challenge that we did not choose, but one that we can rise above.